You see a 9-9. Olga Corbett's won a gold medal. There it is. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. You're listening to a podcast from Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, a series showcasing the work of expert sports historians. I'm Vince Hunt and I'm hosting the series, exploring how sport became a frontier in an era of superpower politics and intense international competition. There are more than 30 podcasts in our series now, which you can listen to on iTunes and Stitcher. They're curated by Laura Deal at the Wilson Centre in Washington. Please feel free to rate and review them. Follow us on Twitter at CWIHP and hashtag Cold War Sport. And thanks to our regular listeners for their positive feedback. Paul Cawthorn is a political historian at Queen's University in Belfast, specialising in 20th century British political history. His area of particular interest is the political and public debate in Britain, leading up to the boycott of the 1980 Moscow Olympics. Well, Paul, perhaps we ought to start with what was the political landscape in Britain leading up to that particular time? Margaret Thatcher had come to power as Conservative Prime Minister in May 1979. Uh, So at the point at which uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan took place, which was uh, towards the end of December 1979, the the Thatcher government hadn't actually been in power uh, for for all that long. So so I think that that is largely the the context. On the the Labour side, the Labour Party having just lost the, the 1979 general election, Jim Callaghan still as late Labour leader, and the the Liberals at this point are not a major force with, within within British politics. But but it's not too long actually if we if we move into the future before the the formation of of the SDP and the SDP alliance. So that's that's looming on the horizon, but it's not it's not occurred as yet. So this is one of the first uh, issues for Margaret Thatcher to deal with. So what does she do? It's certainly one of the first um, foreign policy issues that Thatcher has to has to face. What I think she does is she aligns the government or attempts to align the government with the United States. Uh, Jimmy Carter, right at the beginning of 1980, has suggested uh, that uh, a boycott of the Moscow Olympics would would be a very desirable thing. Thatcher is very keen from from that stage onwards to um, work with the United States in in pushing that line. What does she do then? Is there any public support for a boycott? Uh, does she have any reasons uh, for backing this particular line? The case made very strongly is that this is a, a reaction to um, the Soviet invasion of, of Afghanistan. The government is involved in international discussions about the issue with the, the European community and, and with parts of NATO uh, in late 1979, early 1980. But, it, but it's not until... Um, I think it's the 17th of, of January that the, the cabinet actually backs the idea of, of a boycott. That's the, also the day that Thatcher announces uh, British support for that policy to the House of Commons. The problem looming in the background, though, from the government's point of view, is that it isn't the government's decision to, to make. It's the British Olympic Association, the BOA, which will actually make the decision whether or not its athletes are, um, are going to go or, or not. And does Mrs Thatcher have any political uh, sway over the BOA? Uh, She she certainly um, attempts to have. She's also very keen uh, in the early stages of the the debate to suggest that uh, an American idea might be a possibility. That's the possibility of moving moving the Olympics to to a different location. Um, that's an idea that doesn't actually materialise, but she is actually relatively hopeful early on that this could be something that might might persuade the athletes to to follow the course that she she wants them to. But she doesn't actually, uh, in the event, turn out to have as much um, sway over the athletes as she had hoped, uh, despite uh, strongly worded letters to the uh, president of the British Olympic Association. So Dennis follows at that point in time. Uh, she she isn't able to persuade the athletes to um to 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 do what she wants. That there is a substantial government campaign to try to do that. It involves a, a a debate in the House of Commons, but at the end of the day, the British Olympic Association makes the decision uh, towards the end of March of 1980 that it will recommend um, its its athletes to to attend the games. Among the athletes, are there any particular personalities who take a stand against Mrs. Thatcher? Because this, of course, is to do with the lifetime of an athlete. It's a big thing that they're 
being asked to do and they might be unwilling to give up their athletic one chance of uh, an Olympic medal for something they may not care about. I, th- I think that is, that is um, the position of, of many many athletes. There are arguments made that the athletes are being asked themselves to make um, um, a particular sacrifice on this issue. And, and, in, and in some ways it, it may even be the case that the government has actually, um, well, kind of public attention ha- has begun to focus increasingly on, on this issue of the boycott, I guess because it's, a, it's, a, it's an Olympic competition, an Olympic year, great public excitement ab- about this issue, great public interest in it. The government, it, the, the proposed boycott of the Olympic Games wasn't by any means the, the government's only uh, response to the invasion of Afghanistan. The raft of other um, things the government was attempting to do, arguably the government doesn't really sell those other things that it's attempting to do quite as well as it might do. And it does leave itself, I think, quite liable to the, to, to the uh, point that many athletes make which is we're being asked to make this sacrifice ourselves that maybe isn't more widely the case. Probably the most um, the most well-known would be the um, the, the runners, uh, Sebastian Coe and Steve Ovett, um, who uh, had the, the very famous um, showdown over the 800 and uh, 1500 metres at that Olympic Games. Um, certainly, um, Sebastian Coe comes under um, indirect pressure uh, to boycott the games, not attend himself. That there are meetings held with his uh, father and manager uh, to in- to encourage him to not attend. But nonetheless, Co does attend and sticks very firmly to that to that position. His father makes it quite clear in those meetings that he is his son will be attending the the games and resists the arm twisting. Yes, and I think it's um I think from an athlete's point of view, it, it's something that ma- many of them um, resisted. There were some um, sporting bodies which decided um, not to attend um, hockey, um, yachting, equestrianism are, are among those. But the vast majority of, of athletes do actually um, do actually attend the games. When these British athletes go to Moscow, do they have a British identity? I, th- I think it's um, to some extent they, they they of course continue to do so. But they are most famously represented under the um, the, the International Olympic Association's um, flag, rather than the uh, uh, Un- United Kingdom flag. So I think that's that's one very visible way in which that so that identity is, to some extent, uh, d- d- diminished. But I think once the once the actual Olympic Games are, are underway, there's of course great public interest in in the uh, in the competitions taking place. Um, Co-Ovet enlisting I- particular. Uh, amounts of amount, amounts of interest. What's also uh, point worth emphasising is that um, as the games get ever closer, that there there are opinion polls which show increasing amount of um, public support for for British participation in the in the in the Olympic Games. And interestingly, this is Britain's greatest prominence for a number of Olympiads, isn't it? Yes, I I, th- I think it is, and it's also. Um, it's also with the with the clash between um, Cohen and Ovet, one that has, um, I mean, it's it's a, it's a tremendously good good story at the end at the end of the day. For Mrs. Thatcher, the athletes marching into the Olympic Stadium in Moscow must have been something of a defeat for her. I I, th- I think it was. Um, that said, um, I think the the episode as a whole um, cannot be seen as a as, as an absolutely decisive um, de- defeat. Partly because I think that by the time a, a large part of the public debate had actually taken place earlier on in, in 1980, January, February, March was the, the, the month when the, the big debate was held in the House of Commons. The, the, the games themselves obviously held in the summer. A certain amount of time has passed. Um, other, other things have happened. Other, other things have, have risen to prominence. I think there's also in a um, in terms of the the way in which the uh, some, some of the British successes are portrayed in the media that there, there is simply a, a case of a, an, an interest in those competitions themselves and a desire to celebrate them rather than hark back to uh, an, an, an earlier debate. I, I also said I think it's not um it wasn't an absolutely decisive um, defeat for, for Thatcher. And the re- reason I said that is that um, what the, the 1980 boycott debate had revealed was, was actually quite a range of divisions. Not, 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 there wasn't simply one conservative position that emerged, one Labour position, for example. But both those parties were actually divided within themselves o- over the desirable uh, response to take. So, so some people, the, the Labour parties, um, 
official um, view view is to oppose the idea of the boycott. They they believe very strongly in a a continuing um, degree of detente. They believe very strongly that a degree of international exchange was a very, very good thing in international affairs. Some people in the Labour Party even believe this might bring about an end to the the Cold War. Equally, others in the Labour Party were more uh, favourable to the idea of a boycott uh, not necessarily on the grounds of um, the invasion of Afghanistan, but because of the uh, the Soviet Union's human rights record. Uh, equally, within the um, Conservative Party, uh, not 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 everybody agreed with with Thatcher. Hector Monroe, the Minister for Sport at this point in time, uh, did not actually agree with the the boycott uh, policy. Equally, there were some on the on the right of the Conservative Party in the in the Monday Club who made it very clear that their view was that a that an Olympic boycott really simply did not go anywhere near far enough to to deal with this um, with with Soviet action, and that a more a stronger, more military response was actually what was what was needed. And British involvement in the Cold War. Would you say that Britain was a a major player? I mean, here we have Margaret Thatcher taking up a position almost as a as an ally of Jimmy Carter and a, a Cold War warrior. I think at various points in time, Britain did play a, a prominent part in the in the Cold War. Uh, I think the overall uh, chronology of this uh, goes go something like this: that at the at the very beginning of the Cold War, 1945, 46, 47, throughout that decade into the early 1950s, Britain is actually playing quite a prominent role within within international affairs. The the there's still a very very considerable Brit- British Empire at this point in time. There's certainly a British global uh, reach. There's also deep British involvement, uh, for example, in in occupied uh, Germany. Um, But the British role um, in the Cold War, and indeed uh, the British role in the wider world, falls off after uh, the the Suez Crisis of 1956. It falls off amid um, increasing amount of um, British decolonization, withdrawal from from significant parts of the world. It it falls off... uh, as we move into the 1960s, as, as Britain focuses more and more of its attention of, in terms of trying to get into the, the European community. The next period when Britain really plays a, a significant role in the Cold War internationally, I think only comes in the, in the 1980s. It comes under, under Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and I think that really uh, takes two forms. One, one is the, um, the, the very close relationship that Thatcher seeks to develop with the, the United States. You mentioned before it, it's already uh, present under um, Carter as, as president. It becomes even closer uh, and much more ideologically, uh, much much more ideologically close under um, Ronald Reagan, who becomes U.S. president in early uh, 1981. Thatcher uh, later on in the 1980s also plays a, a very a very significant role in the, in the Cold War as some kind of mediator between uh, Reagan and, and Gorbachev. Uh, she, she seemingly from from the off found Gorbachev somebody who she considered it was possible to to work with. And Mrs Thatcher embraces Mr Gorbachev's ideas and she likes what he's talking about. In in some ways, she might have been a channel for change, a mediator for the end of the Cold War. I I think Thatcher herself would be very keen to... um to, to take that, uh, that take that viewpoint, um, I think I think there are undoubtedly um, the the role is undoubtedly important. Um, I, I think, though, in terms of the the bigger picture of the end of the Cold War, is is one factor that needs to be placed am, among many in internal developments in terms of what's happening within the Soviet Union itself, the position of the United States, and and there's a, I think there's some others as well. But so I think it is it is one factor that, that can be can be worked into that that equation. You've been listening to a podcast from the series Key Moments in Cold War Sports History, a project bringing together experts from around the world and hosted here on the Wilson Centre's online digital archive at digitalarchive.org. These podcasts are part of the project The Global History of Sport in the Cold War, which is sponsored by the National Endowment of the Humanities, directed by Professor Bob Edelman of UC San Diego, Professor Chris Young from the University of Cambridge, and Dr Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Centre, and run in collaboration with the German Historical Institute Moscow, the Jordan Centre for Advanced Russian Studies at New York University, and Pembroke College, University of Cambridge. The presenter is Vince Hunt and the series is produced by